Oh, people are attending right now, so that's good. Good morning, good afternoon for all the people who are joining. We're waiting for a couple of minutes uh, to actually start the webinar. Um, so if we have a little bit more participants joining in and it goes very fast, then we'll start. Okay, um, I want to welcome everybody to the first webinar of the Netherlands Business Support Office. We are very, very proud to have such interesting speakers. My name is Saskia Pardans. I'm the Chief Representative of the Netherlands Business Support Office. Before we start the webinar, uh, I want to explain the rules during the webinar. Um, the Q&A is only for questions and they will be answered at the end of the webinar. The chat is used for general remarks only, so don't put your questions in the chat, please. Okay, we have decided to organize this webinar because our trade mission to Texas was postponed exactly a month ago, because, yeah, a month ago we would have been in Texas altogether because of COVID. And we want to keep everybody interested in the developments in Texas regarding e-health and digital health. The digitalization of life science has grown enormously during Corona, and not only in the Netherlands, but also in Texas. And it's very interesting to hear from our speakers how we can learn from each other and how we can cooperate in new solutions. And again, I'm very happy to introduce our speakers. We have three very inspiring speakers who will take us into the world of e-health and digital health. Maria, can you show the next slide? Uh, our first speaker will be Nora Belcher. She's the executive director of the Texas eHealth Alliance. Then we hear about more about Lance Black. He's the associate director of TMC Innovation. And finally, Carmen von Vilsen will tell us everything about what's happening in the Netherlands. She's chair of the top sector, life science and health in the Netherlands. So thanks again for being here. I'm really proud to have you as our speakers. Uh, Nora, I want to give you the floor to, uh, so you can tell us more about the developments of digitalization in Texas. Thank you, Saskia, for that um, kind introduction. Let me, oh, the slides are even cooperating, so we're off to a good start. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nora Belcher. I'm the executive director of the Texas eHealth Alliance. We are a trade association. So we represent all sorts of digital health companies from the very large to the very small at the Texas State Capitol working on legislation, policy and regulation. And just a little bit about me, I have been working in the digital health space for 25 years, including a number of leadership roles with our Medicaid program and our governor's office. And I started as a computer programmer. So I have essentially been trying to digitize things ever since I first got my hands on a computer and I really do consider it to be my life's work. So as the first speaker, I think my job is really to paint the big picture of digital health in Texas. So I wanna to start to do that by talking a little bit about the scope and scale of our state. As you may know, Texas is quite large. We are a state of 29 million people, which represents one in 12 Americans currently. Interestingly, we are projected to be one in 10 Americans living in Texas by the year 2040, which is really not that far off if you think about the fact that we're in 2020. Uh, interestingly, also one in 10 live births in the United States is also happening in Texas. So we have enormous population and demographic growth that is growing our market and growing those economic opportunities for people who want to sell into these markets. So with that big picture in mind, um, I wanna talk about how our state has integrated digital health into the response to the coronavirus. Our governor has been very proactive in terms of lifting restrictions on the use of services like telemedicine and telehealth as part of pandemic response. And some of this is following in the direction that was given by the federal government, particularly our Medicare program 
to use digital health tools like telemedicine to enforce social distancing. So trying to use technology to deliver healthcare services to people while preserving that distance that you need to control the spread of the disease. I'm gonna give some examples of that on the next slide. I also wanna point out that one of the big learnings coming out of the pandemic is that we have really exposed some gaps in our ability to share data that will need to be addressed. And a lot of that will be addressed by technology solutions. We still have an enormous amount of paper. We still have an enormous number of things that get faxed. So even though we have pretty much fully transitioned to electronic medical records, over 90% of our hospitals and about 75% of our physicians have those tools. We have seen during the pandemic that we still have an awful lot of manual processes. So if that's the space that your company works in, then this is a good market to be in because we have a real need for solutions to improve those processes. So I would like next to speak just for a minute to some examples of how those digital health tools are being used. First, uh, telemedicine consultations. So we have had telemedicine in Texas since the 1990s, and we have been growing that market sort of every cycle. But during pandemic response, we have expanded this to modalities like the telephone for establishing treating relationships and providing services, even going so far as to let people renew prescriptions for pain medication over the phone, which would normally require an in-person visit. We do expect a lot of those changes to be permanent, maybe not all of the changes related to telephone, but we certainly think that the telemedicine market has grown from only about 10% of providers doing telemedicine to estimates as high as 75 to 80% of providers doing telemedicine, and they're going to need tools and services. Additionally, we have found that there are non-physician services, uh, which we generally refer to as telehealth, that are important. As an example, our Medicaid program, which serves uh, persons with disabilities, has expanded how therapies can be delivered. So one of the things that we do is music therapy, which has great results for persons with autism and other disorders that would normally be done in the home. We're now doing that virtually via telehealth and seeing really good results. And finally, I wanna make one point about data and infrastructure. Um, our country is federalized, so we have the federal government, the state governments, and the local governments. Disaster response is at local, and so local public health departments and local elected officials are making a lot of decisions about tools. So when you start to talk about contact tracing and data analysis and that sort of thing, there are numbers of opportunities because you have multiple purchasers in the space because Houston might do something different from Dallas, which might do something different from Austin. And while the state has a role, a lot of that activity is local. And Houston is a great example of that. So with that, Saskia, I'm gonna close and let the mic transition over to Lance to talk about TMC. Saskia, you are on mute. Uh, Nora, thank you so much for your interesting presentation. Uh, at the end of the webinar, we have questions for you, of course. Uh, Lance, we are very curious to hear about your experiences and expectations with dig digitalization during and after COVID-19. So the floor is yours when the presentation is ready. Thanks. Thank you, Saskia. Hi, everyone. My name is Lance Flack, and a little bit about my background. I started my career as a biological engineer focused on the development and um, building out of prosthetics and orthotics. I then went to medical school and studied family medicine as well as amputee care in the military. So I served in the United States Air Force for about seven years practicing medicine, at which point I really decided to go back into medical technology and focus my efforts on working with startup companies in the medical device and digital health space and have been doing so for the past seven years. And my career at TMC Innovation has been really focused on supporting those at the earliest stages of uh, entrepreneurship to get them into the hospitals to really challenge their ideas and also validate the technology and its clinical focus. I want to talk a little bit about TMC Innovation with you today. Let's see if my... So TMC Innovation is a non-for-profit private organization that supports the world's largest medical center, which is known as the Texas Medical Center. Obviously, the acronym TMC stands for such. And as Nora pointed out, everything is bigger in Texas. 
Uh, the Texas Medical Center is, like I mentioned, the world's largest. We serve 10 million patient visits per year. We host over 60 what we call member institutions. And just for some clarification, a member institution is a hospital, an academic center, a research organization, anything that's focused on the advancement of healthcare education and research, we consider a member institution. So within two square miles, you have 21 hospitals, multiple medical schools, nursing schools, as well as academic institutions. It truly is its own medical city. And more importantly, from the perspective of a budding and developing healthcare life science company, it's an ultimate proving ground because not only is it, <clears throat> excuse me, a number of different organizations, each organization is actually independent. So it's not one large health system, it's actually multiple health systems co-located. And so we have those that are large academic medical centers. We have government run and operated hospitals. And we also have private non-for-profit organizations all on our uh, two square mile campus. A surgery is conducted every two to three minutes within the Texas Medical Center. And as Nora explained about how many babies are born in Texas, we have a baby born every 30 minutes in the Texas Medical Center. So there's quite a lot of activity happening. We employ over 115,000 people just in the medical center alone. So this is all located in Houston. It has ultimately become the best place for any early stage life science company to validate their technology and validate their business model. There's more research dollars that come into the medical center than anywhere else in the US. And it's actually one of the largest consolidated medical centers in the US and in the world with over 10,000 hospital beds uh, co-located amongst our different hospitals. We are home to the world's largest cancer institute, MD Anderson, as well as the large, largest children's institute, Texas Children's Hospital. So we have quite a few health systems that could stand alone and be their own uh, stalwart within healthcare, co-located amongst other stalwarts. The Texas Medical Center Innovation Institute is really focused on supporting the two elements. One is the importation of new technology into our healthcare systems. And secondly, the exportation of new technology coming out of our health systems. And so we really sit at the crossroads of that two-way street. We have over 300 life science companies that we support in our community through a multitude of programs. And I'll mention a little bit more about these programs in detail here in just a second, but you can think of the programs as a curated set of resources that really focus on the different stages within a life science company. So if you're a physician that just has an idea and wants to figure out what the next steps are, we have a program for that. Or if you're a life science company who's raised a series A and are looking to scale their technology into an enterprise system, we have a program for that. With over a dozen programs, we support a variety of life science companies in a, at a variety of stages. Our space is about a half million square feet dedicated to these life science companies. And it's everything from office space to corporate partners, labs. For instance, we have J&J co-located with us, as well as AT&T and ABB Robotics, large names in the healthcare sector that are looking to support our life science startup companies. So TMC Innovation really is a community, a space, and a set of resources all dedicated to supporting healthcare. I wanna highlight a number of our startups in this particular uh, interesting case we find ourselves with COVID and how they've either curated their current product and current offering to be better suited for the COVID response or creating new products in light of the COVID uh, pandemic in order to accommodate our hospitals. One of our companies, Trusted Health, which is a TMCX alumni. TMCX is our medical device and digital health accelerator, and also a TMC venture fund portfolio company. We do invest in early, life, early stage life science companies. And it's a mobile platform for nurses that helps them to find opportunities uh, uh, around our different hospitals. And so I'm not sure how it is in the Netherlands, but in the US, many of our nurses work for a multitude of hospitals and have shifts sometimes in the same week at different hospitals. And as you can imagine, in a place like the Texas Medical Center, where there's one hospital right after another down the street, it's easy for them to kind of manage uh, in between those hospitals and take different shifts. Well, since COVID hit, as you can imagine, the human resources has been severely restrained. And so Trusted stepped in and started offering teleconferencing and telehealth resources to their 100,000 nurse platform. And so with the click of a button and through an app, a nurse can find which shifts are available to her or to him, 
depending on their credentials and their expertise levels, whether it's an in-person shift or now, whether it's a telehealth or teleconferencing shift. So Trusted has been a great partner for us and has been supporting us for the past two and a half years. They're actually based out of the West Coast but have a lot of activity in Houston. The next company I'd like to introduce to you is Luminaire. This is a Houston born and grown company. Uh, they did go through TMCX as well, and now they reside with us on our campus through a program called TMCX Plus, which is an incubator program where a lot of our life science companies live and operate. Luminaire is, was started by an infectious disease physician who had a great idea of how to screen for patients who are at risk of sepsis and was able to predict with his proprietary algorithms within matters of hours sometimes who was going to develop sepsis and then allow their caretakers to provide care prior to that actually from a, uh, to prevent or to, to treat while occurring. What Luminaire did when COVID struck is they took their internal uh, technologies and they repurposed it uh, to ultimately become a screening tool, <clears throat> excuse me, for those patients looking for care within our health systems and to prevent them from actually coming in if they were at risk and to help take care of them prior to their arrival or at least determine who needed to come in versus who didn't. So in order to provide uh, extra social distancing or to prevent people from exposure, Luminaire really helps make a big difference in Houston. And in fact, this their program, Quick Screen, was adopted by our Harris County uh, uh, department, which as Nora alluded to, it is our, our county's responsibility for emergency response. And Harris County is what's responsible for Houston as well as nine other counties, or sorry, nine other cities within Texas. And so Luminaire has been adopted uh, by that governmental organization to deploy the technology. The last company I'll mention is Medical Informatics. And Medical Informatics has been with us for, for about four years now, living in TMCX Plus. Uh, medical Informatics, it, it almost perfectly aligned with the COVID response because they already had dedicated resources focused on remote monitoring of critically ill patients. Uh, what they call their sick bay is sort of a remote ICU. So it allows uh, a critical care physician remotely to monitor over 100 patients at a time. Something normally you would not be able to do, obviously, because of all the data coming in, but their algorithms allow them to respond accordingly based on whether there's a, an alert or a, a concerning patient based on their vitals and remote monitoring uh, that's going on. The uh, sick bay allows them to be able to do that in a centralized manner. And so we were able to stand up using sick bay in one of our hospitals, Methodist, Houston Methodist, a command central really for critically ill patients. And so instead of having ICU physicians go to multiple locations, they can sit in one location in Methodist and monitor hundreds of patients. And so this was pivotal in being able to, for us to take care of these critically sick patients and, and those that were intubated due to COVID. Uh, and so companies like Medical Informatics really transformed the way we were able to uh, take care of our patients during this incredible time. And so I'll just close with once again, inviting you to take a look at TMC Innovation. If you're interested in exploring the US market or if you already have traction in the US market, even better, we would love to talk with you about your technology and see where there's a fit for you within Texas Medical Center. And, and thanks for your time. Well, Lenz, great to hear your story. And I'm, uh, yeah, I know TMC Innovation is a very inspiring env environment where new ideas arise all the time. So it's, um, yeah, it's great to, heard, to have heard all the companies uh, who have worked and dealt with uh, COVID-19. So thanks again for your time. Um, Maria, I think we're gonna have a poll right now, if the technique uh, helps us. Yes, um, well, I have a question for the audience. Uh, we're talking about digitalization in healthcare today. And my question to you is, have you experienced a virtual health uh, consultation since the pandemic started? I'm really curious to hear or see what the results will be. And we wait just a few moments uh, before we end the poll. I think, uh, Maria, you can end the poll right now because uh, nobody is voting anymore.
And it's interesting to see, I don't know if all our, our um, panelists can see the results as well. Um, oh, okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll share the results. What you see right now is that 81% uh, hasn't experienced a virtual health consult yet during the pandemic. So I think we have a very healthy audience because uh, what I heard from Nora and from Carmen is that uh, uh, e-health is, is, is rising very fast. So I'm happy to hear that our audience is very healthy. Um, I would like to introduce Carmen right now. So we're, the poll was just to get an idea of uh, what our audience is thinking and experiencing. Um, Carmen would have been our delegation, delegation leader during the trade mission to Texas. And I'm happy uh, that you get to know Texas a little bit more during this webinar, Carmen. Uh, you hear some experiences. And I hope you can build the bridge between the Netherlands and Texas and explain how and where we could work together. So, Carmen, the floor is yours when the poll is gone. Maria, can you um, make sure the poll? Oh, it's gone. Yes. Carmen, the floor is yours. Thank you, Saskia. I also think it's, uh, I find it a pity that uh, we, are not, we were not able to visit you in, uh, in, in, in Texas and Houston. <clears throat> I've been in Houston once, to be honest. But that's uh, almost 20 years ago and that was a business visit so i stayed there exactly 24 hours so i would love to have a little bit more time but within these 24 hours i did visit md anderson so in that sense uh, i have some glance of uh, what's happening in boston and indeed it's huge yeah you mentioned all the numbers it's a huge uh, big uh, it's almost a country on itself i would say so i would like to tell a little bit about uh, the netherlands what is what is uh, what's happening uh, in, in in here um, and to give you an overview first about two years ago um, the, our government decided to uh, define a couple of uh, long-term missions on uh, different topics one on climate and one on security and also one on health and care and the mission our government did define was that in 2014 we want to have all the Dutch citizens to live five years longer in good health. Yeah, so that's a kind of ambition. So that's about 20 years and it's quite, uh, it's quite an ambition, uh, ambition. But it was even in addition to that, we also would like to reduce our health inequalities between the highest and lowest um, social groups with 30%. Because if you only improve health uh, in general, it turns out that only the, 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 the more um, higher educated and, and um, and um, richer people became more healthy, but not the lower classes, and you increase actually the difference between that. So how do we want to realize that? We have defined uh, five uh, what we call uh, submissions, and these are about the prevention, lifestyle and life environment, about uh, care at the, at the right spot, uh, or the um, um, accessibility of care, about chronic disease, and about um, dementia. dementia. And you will see yeah, that e-health actually plays a role in all these five uh, submissions. And in addition to these missions, we have also said, well, that's nice to, um, to, to do that in the Netherlands, but we also would like to do pilots yeah, that we share abroad. And that's exactly yeah, why I like this, uh, these missions and also this um, uh, webinar. So what is the situation about e-health? And I will tell you pre-COVID, during COVID and after COVID, and uh, not so long ago, only a few months ago, end of last year, our yearly e-health monitor came out. And what you will see here is that um, in different parts of healthcare, and um, these are the, the different colors in this graph, the adoption rate of e-health is between 10% and 40%. So that is not only low, but you also see that it is quite stable. Right? There is not a huge grow. And uh, in the Netherlands, e-health is already some time, um, for some time, it's, it's even reimbursed. Eh? So for a lot of e-health things, it, it was not reimbursed in the past, but it is reimbursed right now. But that was the situation uh, only, well, let's say three months ago. And uh, at the same as Nora mentioned it, uh, it was not only this, um, uh, also the whole data infrastructure, there were quite some holes uh, in that, uh, as Nora um, mentioned. So we have a lot of local data infrastructures between two hospitals, between the first line and another hospital, in a certain group, but uh, there's not an, a national health infrastructure yet. So now, if we look into the current situation, and I, of course I do not have scientific figures yet, eh, because it's too short, but I did uh, check it with our National Institute for eHealth. The estimation is that today, digital consults happens 20 times more. 
telemonitoring in cardio, uh, for cardiac patients, 10 times more. Health applications in general, six times more. And I think you mentioned the same figure, 80% of all consults with the first line are telemonitored. So this is huge, this is huge. So I think it is the moment now, and sorry, Nora, you have to rename your center to forget about this e-health. It's regular health. And let's stop with this word, it's regular health. And that's not my, I didn't come up with that idea, to be honest. Lucien Engele, who is a, who is an, a very important influencer in the Netherlands on the, on the domain of health there, he, uh, he mentioned that, and I very much agree with him, but he, I also will acknowledge him for, for the suggestion. So what's happened more? So it's not only it's, it's not only the new ways of health. Eh? It is really going from uh, a, um, a, conserver, a conservative hospital into a digital consultant and a digital hospital. You see here an example of a kind of uh, smart sensor that will be um, uh, used as a kind of, of blizzard or as a band aid in a hospital first to monitor the vital signals of the patient. And then every, all the details are, are monitored centrally in the hospital. And so the, the doctor or the nurse do not need to be at the patient anymore, but all the signals are, are monitored. And of course, it's not only uh, the, the, the signal that's monitored, but a lot of continuous data is collected. And so you see there also the need for a better infrastructure and interpreted by artificial intelligence. So you really see that we go from um, teleconsulting in this phase very um, march towards digital hospitals. But the next st step, of course, is the home hospital. And so why not use this uh, fast um, a blizzard also at a home situation? And, and, uh, and an, a doctor or somebody can monitor it as the hospital. Uh, I had um, yesterday uh, a discussion about this topic because this is a Philips sensor with um, uh, Jeroen Tas. He is the chief uh, innovation and strategy um, uh, of um, Philips. And he, uh, he, he also see that same trend. Eh? So they see that happening, not only of course in the Netherlands, but also all over the world. And also he, he said, it's all start with reimbursement. And eh? that's the first question I'm, uh, I'm asking uh, you uh, mentioned to me. So this is what happened during COVID, but I'm pretty sure it will continue after COVID and go into in, uh, even further into this direction. Um, this is something that uh, we are also working on in the Netherlands to reduce the risk of, sp of, of uh, COVID uh, spreading. Uh, the government is developing an app or, or probably a platform of apps to monitor people or to uh, get a signal if somebody that gets infected can be traced back which kind of context he or she had in the last two weeks. And then these people get an alert eh, to uh, make sure they do not infect others. This is still under development. Okay, how can we work more together? It's definitely not the technology that's the bottleneck. Yeah? It's about data, data sharing, uh, and these kind of things. So, and that's not so easy to bridge, to be honest, not even within a country, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not easy to bridge. Yeah? So it will be even harder to bridge that over the ocean. But um, some of the ideas that I collected is we can organize a joint uh, hackathon or, or share internships. End of the year, there will be, um, uh, the World of Healthcare Symposium. Uh, and also there, the topic is the world of digital transformation. So there are a lot of opportunities, I think, in the future to share um, more knowledge and even project potentially, and to get connected. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Carmen. Uh, it's very interesting to learn that the Dutch are the international front runners in e-health. And uh, yeah, I do hope that uh, we don't know when yet, but there's going to be another trade mission to Texas. The question is when, but we really want to organize it. So um, yeah, then I hope that we can see everybody in person again. Um, something else I want to mention. So uh, it's the vouchers, uh, because we've been talking about doing business internationally, um, where I'm just waiting for that slide. Yeah. Um, yeah, the voucher, we, there are a couple of vouchers available uh, from the different kind of ministries and organizations, uh, among others, uh, Task Force Health, um, and they can help you uh, do business international. So I'm not going to get into detail about these different kind of vouchers, but we will send you the information 
later on with everything else. So um, then you learn, okay, how can we help, uh, how can the government help us to do, to do business abroad? And now we go back to the questions. Uh, I hope we have a lot of questions. And Suze Kruis here from the Task Force Healthcare has moderated these questions and she will go through the questions with you and to the different speakers. So Suze, the floor is yours. Thank you, Saskia, and thank you as well to the speakers. I think um, their presentations were very insightful and also um, well, connected some things that we were working on in, in the Netherlands uh, to the things that you are working on in the United States and in Texas and specifically. Um, the first question I would like to address to Nora Belcher. It was uh, posed by Robin van Stockholm. So Nora, to what degree are there initiatives to create a connected, be it decentralized digital health data infrastructure? Could you provide us with an answer? That's a great question. Um, so I think there's a couple of things that are important there. Number one is uh, the technology has matured so now we have an acceleration of our ability to use standards to exchange data that we didn't have maybe even five years ago. So some of it is being driven by the industry collaborating to develop standards so that it's easier to share the data. And the second piece of it is we had some federal legislation passed a few years ago called the 21st Century Cures Act. And in the Cures Act, they set some standards to prevent what's called information blocking, which was a huge issue where hospitals and other providers would say, I'm not going to share the data, period. And there, a lot of those barriers have now been dropped by the government to say, particularly on treatment of patients, you have to share, you have to participate in a data sharing ecosystem unless you have a really good reason. So between taking those barriers down and I think the accelerated pace of needing to share data, we had some of those pieces line up prior to the pandemic. And then there are some new initiatives out of uh, our Federal Department of Health and Human Services to make that infrastructure even stronger. And if folks wanna reach out to me, I can share specific information on what that looks like. Thank you. I think you immediately also answered the uh, third question that we received from Caroline Tenkate that um, is asking that, uh, well, she's supposing that one of the barriers of e-health in the last years has been the protection of privacy. And has this been covered better in the last period or did Texas or the Netherlands lower the barrier due to the crisis? Well, Nora, you explained that there are some uh, talk about lowering the barriers. Um, Carmen, do you know something about that with regard to the situation in the Netherlands? Yes, I think um, uh, I know that, that uh, there has been a kind of, uh, how do you call that, um, emergency law change uh, about privacy of uh, the data of first, uh, the data from patients that are, that are handed over by first line to the hospital. So right now, hey, it's, it's official. Uh, from the previous law, it was not possible that the hospital could look in that, into that data. And temporarily, there has been a law to make it possible for COVID patients, to, have to um, for other doctors to look into the, the data of the first line. That's, but I'm, I think it's, I understood it as a temporary um, uh, release of, uh, of, the, of, the, of this law. Thank you. I hope this has answered your question, Caroline. Um, then I have another question of Niels Postma, and I would like to direct it first to Nora, but uh, she told me that Lance probably has to add something as they had an issue uh, specifically regarding uh, this question. Um, the question is, is certification of medical equipment for home use an issue in the United States, States or Texas in particular? In other words, would it be interesting for a hospital a patient or a caregiver to know whether the appliances that are used at home instead of in the hospital are genuine, safe, and certified. So Nora, first to you, and then maybe you could also explain what you think that Lance can add. Sure, so our uh, Federal Food and Drug Administration sets standards and provides certification for that sort of equipment, whether it's for use in a hospital or now for use at home. And they've had to be very aggressive during the pandemic because initially we had people advertising in-home coronavirus tests that had not been validated and certified at all. 
So some of those companies actually had to pull their advertising because they were saying to the public, we have a test, we can test you for coronavirus, but it had not been approved and vetted by our uh, federal standard setting body. And that was back in March and now we're in May and some of those tests have been approved for home use because they went through the proper process. And I think with Lance's background, I'd like to get him to see if he wants to add anything to that. Getting that certification is, is not easy. There are steps and processes, and that's why working with somebody like TMC X is important because they have people who know how that works because we want the public to be safe and we want the standards to be met. So that's sort of my short version of the answer, but I want to pass that off to my colleague to see if he's got anything to add. Yeah, thanks, Nora. And the answer is a resounding yes. Uh, that was the case prior to COVID. And I think COVID just, you know, rose to the surface even more problems, as Nora pointed out, with uh, home use of medical equipment. The, uh, the hospitals are now becoming more responsible for what's happening at home as they push care out of their, uh, of their particular four walls in order to reduce the cost of healthcare overall. So there's much more of a general, general value-based driven perspective that healthcare systems are starting to adopt. Although, albeit slowly, I can't, I can't say that we're where we should be right now with regards to value-based uh, healthcare. But with that being said, um, there's certainly a number of things that we're looking at and how we can better care for patients virtually, remotely, uh, because we know that the setting is ultimately what translates to the cost. If you're gonna do the same procedure in an ICU versus a clinic versus at home, the cost is exponentially different. And so with that being said, there's more and more push to say, let's do things that we can do, are used to do traditionally in a clinic at home. And so certainly uh, certification of that medical equipment is there's now gonna become somewhat a responsibility of the hospital. Obviously there's still the FDA that the manufacturer has to go through, but the hospital is obviously ultimately responsible for the, the, the types of equipment it uses and the choice uh, between different types of equipment uh, within the same sector. So answer is yes, for sure. Okay, and maybe you could add something about your experience as to what extent um, e-health education of home health care will become important in the upcoming years. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be glad to take that. In fact, we've seen a number of companies uh, focus on this particular aspect, uh, not just the, the education, but also the training of home health providers. It's interesting in Texas, uh, and, and of course in the U.S. as well, home health care is it's pretty decentralized. There's, it's a number of small private organizations that have traditionally uh, executed or uh, given um, or provided home health. And so what we're seeing now is more of a consolidation of those smaller companies and also the acquisition of some of those companies into our larger health systems. So that's a pretty big change in how we've done things historically. And with that change comes obviously a lot more oversight into the type of care and the type of equipment that's being used, as well as the training necessary to be able to execute on that. So right now in Houston alone, there's dozens of home health care uh, companies. Some of them operated by one or two person shops. We call them mom and pop shops here in the US. And so they're very small businesses that will ultimately consolidate and be acquired by these larger health systems. So that's, that's a fundamental shift, I think, in the way that we've traditionally delivered home health care. That's gonna have a great impact. And this is where I see great digital health companies having a big, uh, you know, big impact on how we deliver home health care. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I think that that's, you're, you're right in the middle of a trend if, if that's kind of where your business is focused and well. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a similar process going on in the Netherlands, as in many parts of the world. Um, a question by Edwin Maarseveen. I heard that mainly rural hospitals are struggling financially due to the cancellation of elective care visits because of COVID-19. Do you think the hospital sector in Texas will still be open for investing in digital infrastructures and services while also fa uh, facing financial problems? And Nora, I think I could best direct that question to you. Um, sure, that is a really great question. I think. There's a couple of important things to know there. The vast majority of our rural hospitals were already struggling and were already making the transition to a digital infrastructure because quite frankly, that was the only way they were going to survive would be to bring in services, to diversify, to become not hospitals, but healthcare centers for their communities. Another thing that's important to know is that a lot of the rural hospitals in Texas actually have a tax base. So they're supported by local property tax revenue 
and that revenue is relatively stable compared to what incoming revenue they might be getting in the short term or not getting in the short term because of the ban on elective surgeries. That ban has already been rolled back so they can do more procedures now as long as they maintain their stockpile of PPE, their protective equipment, and they keep some reserved capacity of beds in case there is a spike in their region. Um, I will tell you as someone who works with those hospitals on a daily to weekly basis, if they don't make these investments, they will not survive because it is these tools that are going to keep them healthy and, and thriving. And so while they're under short-term stress, I think long-term the leadership of every single one of those facilities understands that the digital infrastructure is the thing that's going to keep them thriving in the long run. Um, once we sort of move out of this emergency situation, uh, the, the last thing I'll say is the head of our rural hospital association told me they've done about 10 years worth of digital health evolution in about eight weeks because they've had to do it as part of pandemic response. So that's a good sign for the future, but it's a fair question to be asking because we, we may lose some hospitals before this is over, particularly the really small ones. Yeah, yeah thank I, you. Can I just add to that real quick? Um, 100% agree with what Nora is saying. In fact, if they don't invest in these digital health technologies, they won't survive, I think is, is, the, is the perspective that a lot of these hospital CEOs in rural areas are having. What we've seen, because it's it's so unique in Houston that you have all of these health systems co-located, it acts as somewhat of a nucleus. And then there's a number of satellite clinics and hospitals within the rural areas that feed off of the mothership, so to speak. And so it's only through digital health and remote monitoring, virtual technologies that they're able to do that. And so they, they recognize that they can't offer necessarily all the services that they traditionally uh, thought they could without having those that connectivity back to the mothership, if you will. So, and it, and, and that's only possible with the right types of um, uh, virtual or digital technology set up in place. We can't, we can no longer rely on fax machines and, and mailings and those kind of things. It's going to have to be done more remotely. Yeah. Yeah, if I, if, if I may add something to that from, from uh, our point of view, I fully agree basically with everything you said. I think the need to invest has become even more visible, and not only for today, but also for the future. I think nobody wants to have this kind of panic and crisis situation again. And so even if, you, if uh, I think it will perhaps be even a kind of overshoot, yeah? so an overshoot in terms of um, be prepared, be prepared on future kind of uh, pandemics uh, and so on. And uh, um, you mentioned uh, the, the, the facts in the Netherlands. I'm not sure if, if you should broadcast that, but it happened that patients went from, from the south of the Netherlands with, to the north because the hospitals were full in the south with their paper file basically on their body in the ambulance. And that's, that's incredible. Nobody wants to, to have that situation again. Yeah, I think Actually, the counter question to, to that has been posed by James Farrell. I think we have time to answer his question and the last one of Sandra Dira before the end of the webinar. James is asking that with the increased expenditure and focus on COVID-19 solutions, uh, do you think that healthcare providers will delay other projects and new solutions for non-COVID related medical conditions? Now, I think either Lance or uh, Nora could answer the question. Um, I will ask Nora first and then maybe see if Lance has something to add. Um, so I think my answer to that question is everything is COVID related now because everything speaks to your capacity and your ability to be responsive both to what COVID might do to your facility and what how that impacts other processes and procedures. So if your product offering is something that makes a different part of the system more efficient there is an argument to be made that that actually creates capacity that we might need in a surge or we might need in a hotspot. So I, as I talk to people who are working in this space, I get the sense that they are, now that we're out of the immediate emergency, they are looking for innovation across the board because everybody is working with limited resources. And so any efficiency you can gain, even if it's not directly COVID related, might help you be responsive to something like COVID. So top line, that's sort of what I'm hearing. Lance may be hearing different things from the folks that he's talking to. Yeah, I don't know that it's different, Nora. It, it, that's a tough question, honestly. Um, I think you're, 
it's harder to get the attention and the mind share necessary to implement non-COVID related if we're going to separate technologies right now, um, only because I think we're still in the kind of the thick of things. People are now focused on the recovery efforts and how to ramp up surgical capacity and elective procedures, namely. Now, you know, you I think Nora's completely right. Everything feels like it's COVID related right now. If it can increase capacity, if it can increase efficiency, if it can save costs, certainly I think you're gonna get the attention. Um, but we we've seen, you know, in the past few months that there has been little interest and maybe, for instance, a new surgical tool that supports, I don't know, cardiothoracic surgery, for instance, because everybody is focused on how do we increase elective procedures. The, to get mind share right now, I think it's very challenging. And unless your business model and your technology has a COVID-related more kind of motif on that piece, uh, it's going to be challenging. But I, I, honestly, I, I foresee that being only temporary. I think, you know, at, it, what, what COVID did in my mind is, uh, just bring to light a lot of the things that people were thinking of already in a, in a more distant path. Oh, we'll do that in five years, we'll do that in 10 years or 25 years. Now it's all just been expedited and compressed and I feel like we're now living the future. So people are starting to think more readily about innovation in general. Um, so, so there's kind of these two factors to consider. One is people are already thinking about innovation in general more readily. And the other one is obviously just coming out of this crisis or what we think is coming out of this crisis, right? Uh, and in, in kind of recovery mode. So there's a little bit of a, uh, a, a I don't know, diametrically opposed thought process right now. Um, but you know, we're still working with healthcare companies. Uh, and you know, even though it's been interesting to try to rejigger their, uh, their business model or, or their messaging to, to apply to COVID related stuff, it's, it's just still getting picked up and people are still interested in it. Yeah, so probably yeah, I, mostly I, it, I, should, it should has, have to do with uh, increasing efficiency, then that's, you still have your business model. So Saskia, I'm looking to Susu, you. Can I, your can your I add one, uh, microphone is Susu, on. can I add one more thing? Yes, of course. Yeah, uh, I showed you in, our, in my first slide, uh, our long-term mission uh, for 2040. And of course, uh, we have plans for that. And of course, we're looking now, how do we have to change these plans? They're not changing that much. Yeah, it's exactly like Len said. It's, it is, it is uh, speeding up some of the things, perhaps a little bit more. But we were already focusing very much on prevention. So right now we are adding, be, be prepared to that. We were looking very much into, uh, into uh, things like chronic diseases and, and so on, as I mentioned. So it is, it is giving a little bit more. It helps, it helps us with, with choosing the focus, yeah, uh, basically. But, but we are not adding a lot of a lot of new other projects. No, it's actually accelerating that the process that was already started. I think I'm looking to yeah. Saskia because we have one question left, but we're also past the time. So maybe we could answer that question uh, to Sandra uh, by email. Yes, if you can do that, it would be great. Uh, because yeah, I want to cl yeah close the, the webinar in a minute uh, because yeah I want to stick to the time uh, as we promised. Uh, Suze, I want to thank you very much for moderating the questions. I think there were a lot of interesting questions and thanks for moderating them on the right way. Nora, Lenz and Carmen, thank you so much for your presentations. Um, yeah, normally I would hand out a small pre a token of appreciation, but it's a little bit hard to do it virtually. So I'll get back to you at one moment uh, with that. Uh, again, thanks again. Uh, audience, if you have any questions, you can contact the MBSO or any of the other organizations. Uh, we have recorded this webinar, so you can also rewatch it. And after this webinar, we will uh, send you all the information necessary. So if you have questions in the future, uh, you know how to find us. And again, it was our first webinar. Uh, I told you, it, maybe it's not professional that I'm going to say it, but I'm going to say it anyway. I was nervous. We were nervous, but I think we did a great job. We'll ask the audience if they agree on that, but thanks again for all your time and uh, have a nice day in the Netherlands and in Texas and see you next time. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Saskia. Bye all. Bye everyone.